Praise the Lord to each and every one. I bring you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And I come to you because I just want to pray and help each and every one of you that I can. And I just thank you all. And I want to pray for our marriages in the name of Jesus. That's what God put on my heart to pray for our marriages. Praise the Lord. Misha Smith, David Smith, Sister Hughes, Brother Durrell, Sister Thelma, Sister Julie and her husband. Praise the Lord. Miss Shelley, Mr. Tommy. Praise the Lord to each and every one. To Latrell and his wife. Praise the Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. And I praise the Lord to each and every one of you, to Elder Taylor, to Sister Taylor. Praise the Lord to each and every one of you that's married and that's finna get married to my sisters and brothers in the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Yes, Lord. And I just wanted y'all to pray with me. Lord, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for this wonderful, beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, for this second day of spring. We just thank you, Lord, for life and life more abundantly. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for life and life more abundantly. We thank you, Lord, for our marriages, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for our family. We thank you, Lord, for keeping us safe from the COVID virus, from the plagues and the pestilence that walk it in darkness. We thank you, Lord, for keeping us safe under your wings, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for each and everything. And Father, we ask you, Lord, to bless our marriages, to give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding on how to be the wives that we need to be for our husbands and give our husbands wisdom and knowledge and understanding to be the husbands that they need to be for us. Oh, Lord, and give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as we train our children in the Lord. Oh, God, and as we treat each and every one of your people. Oh, God, lead and guide us to what we need to say and do. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And I want to uh, read two scriptures to you. And the first scripture is from 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. It says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. So the reason I want to read this scripture is because... It's really for each and every one of us, not just married couples, but it's for each and every one of us. But the way it can apply, that we can use this to apply to ourselves, because that's exactly what we need to do. We need to take the word of God and see how can we see ourselves in this word how God sees us and also how we can examine ourselves because that's what it said. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. So we need to examine ourselves and really we need to do this every day. Um, if we examine ourselves as well as to pray always and not to faint, pray always and not to faint, it will help us not to get so easily offended it will help us to see and as we pray for people and even pray for our enemies and those that despitefully misuse us and pray for our children our husband the um pray for our neighbors pray and pray in in every situation pray 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 and cast all of your curls onto God. Don't hold it onto yourself. Because if you keep holding and packing stuff, you can feel it in your body. It's not good. So it's best to cast it onto God. All of your curls. Because that's the way you have an intimate relationship with God. Is by you, you talking to God. And you listening to God. And you telling him your, yourself. You revealing you to God. Into me see. And that's what you need to do. But as you examine yourself. Then God will start showing you you. So it will help. This is the way it helped me in my in my um in my first marriage. God bless my husband. So he's he's passed now. My my first husband, but in, in my first marriage, it helped me to understand myself. It helped me to understand myself, and it helped me to look at myself. So when I would go to God and and tell God about. What situation I'm having with my husband, you know, like if we have a disagreement, if he make a wrong choice and hurt my feelings or whatever the situation is, God will show me me. 
he would show me how he's married. God is married to the church. God is married to the church. And so God showed me that me. So he showed me that the same way that sometimes my husband had treated me is the same way that I treated God. When, you know, God was loving on me, calling me, and I was just going, doing my own thing before I answered the call to get saved. And also, you know, in the past, I have backslid on God, and that hurted God. It's just like I cheated on God. Every, t every time you sin, it's almost like you sin against God. It's like you cheat on God. And the same way husbands and wife, we don't want our spouses cheating on us. But look what we're doing to God. So... The same, but my God, he tells me, he said, I'm married. He said, I'm married to the backslider. It never says that God divorced the backslider. See, Jesus hated, he said, God hate divorce because they tried to ask him the question, like, when can we put our wife away? You know, for divorce, you know. And Jesus said that God hate divorce. He said Moses wrote that law because the hardness of the heart. But God hate divorce because God never divorced us. Even when we backslid, God said, I'm married to you. The prodigal son, all we had to do was come back home. And so God was showing me that the same way that I felt when I was treated in that way, God felt, you know, he felt bad when we sin against God, every time we sin against God, we grieve the Holy Ghost. And, 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 and even if we sin going to the world, it's like we committing adultery, spiritual adultery. It's like we going in the world and doing that to God. And it hurts God. It hurts God because he loves us. So the same way that God just was willing to forgive me, forgiving me over and over again, that's what I supposed to do to my husband. That's what my husband is supposed to do to me. Because God even told Hosea in the, Bible, in the Bible, go marry a whore. He told Hosea in the Bible to do that. And he said, my, my people have went whoring after other gods. So the same love, like we don't want to be betrayed. We don't want nobody cheating on us. It hurts us. But guess what? When God show you and you do what? Second Corinthians. 13 and 5, examine yourself. You know you committed adultery on God. You know you went out on God when you sinned. God forgave you. So the same way that God forgave you, God is in you. He can help you to forgive your husband, your wife. You can forgive them too. You can forgive them. You can forgive them of every situation. The same, you can forgive all. God can help you. The God inside of you can help you. So not just going out if they're committing adultery but if they offend you hurt you in some kind of way have a forgiving heart i pray that all husbands and wife have a forgiving heart in the name of jesus they need to have a forgiving heart and forgive their husband and forgive their wives they need to forgive them in the name of jesus they need to forgive them and and also um, and I pray that you all will be able to forgive. I mean, forgive each and every one. Because, I mean, when you forgive, woo, it's so beautiful to forgive. Because unforgiveness can cause sickness in your body. It can, it can cause so much havoc on your body. So much bad on your body. But when you was able to forgive, I mean everyone. Ask God to help you to forgive. And he will help you to walk in love. And he will help you to forgive. In the name of Jesus. So, so now, please, please, I beg you. Take 2 Corinthians and use this to examine yourself. And this is the way you can help with others too. To see other people's side, to have empathy, and to understand others. When you start being obedient to God's word, when you start praying for those that despitefully misuse you, when you start, uh, when you start praying for them, when you start praying for them, instead of holding on, do not hold on to offenses. 
Do not hold on to what people, when people hurt you. Do not hold on to when your husband or, or wife, when they say something to hurt you, take it to God. You, you, you pray. You pray. You pray right then and you say, God, please, God, this hurt me. What they said about me, it really hurt me, God. But I'm going to cast this unto you. Take this out. Do not let no root of bitterness come in me. I give it to you in Jesus' name. I release it. I forgive them. Even if they didn't ask for forgiveness, you say, God, I forgive them. And if it's hard for you, just say, God, help me to forgive completely. I let it go in Jesus' name. And you just forgive them in Jesus' name. And um, this is what you do. And it will help you. Don't hold on to it. Don't hold on to it. Don't hold on to it. And don't let the sun, in the Bible it said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give no place to the devil. Do not, uh, do not allow your mind to think on negative. Would you allow somebody to take garbage full of waste, full of feces, and just dump it on you? The same way you would not allow them to dump garbage on you, don't allow the devil to, to dump trash and lies on you. Don't let him keep rehearsing what a person done to you. Oh, you see how they did you like this. You see how they hurt you. And you just constantly rethinking, rethinking all the bad things. Rethinking, rethinking all of it. Don't do that. Don't rethink that. Say, God, I give this to you. I cast it to you. And what you do, you take back your thoughts. Don't allow your thoughts to come apart of you like the different thoughts, like even the thoughts that the devil come at you. What you do is you, 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 you say the word of God. You use the word of God to fight the devil with. You say, pull down every stronghold. You pray like that. Cast down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of you, God. And bring it to captivity. Every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever be of a good report. If it be any virtue, and if it be any praise, Lord, bless that I can think on these things all the days of my life. In the name of Jesus, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord. And, and you think on them things. Don't think on what somebody did to you. Don't, don't think on that. Because you want your mind to be stayed on the things of God. If your mind is stayed on the things of God and not on what somebody did to you or not on other stuff, it will, because our life can be so chaotic and the enemy want to keep you full of distractions. So he will tell you things like throw stuff at you, even stuff about you got to pay the bills, your children did this and all. He'll just throw a lot of things because he don't want your mind to be in perfect peace. But the way you keep your mind in perfect peace have it on the things of God. Meditate on God's word. And, and uh, do not have your ear gates constantly listening to worldly music and looking at all this stuff on TV, social media, and all that. No, 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 no. You feed your spirit with listening to the word of God, with meditating and studying the word of God, with delighting in God, with delighting in the things of God to make yourself stronger. And you think on the things of God. Don't think on... Mm, why did my husband tell me that? Why did he say it in that tone? Why did my wife say that? Why did the children, why did my boss say that? Don't think on that. You cast that stuff to God and so you can be at perfect peace. You want your mind at perfect peace and then you want to be able to talk to God and God talk to you. You don't want your mind boggled down with the curls and the furs of this life or it can have you, your mind will be so, oh, it could be twisted and you, your head will get the hurting and everything because you'll be thinking about, I got to pay this, but I got to do this, I got to do that. But uh-uh, you ask God to order your steps and he will keep you in perfect peace. So that's enough of that. So remember, one of the first, you know, what I read is about examining yourself. And, and know that God is your first love. God is your first love. So some things you're not going to be able to always go to your husband, your wife. With every little thing, go to God. Because God is your first love. And God would, would, would change them. It's not, it's not our job to try to change our husband or our wife. It's not our job to do that. And it's not our job to preach to them. It's not our job to put them down or nothing like that. We don't supposed to do that. We need to go to God and we need to ask God to change it. We need to ask God to show them like whatever that we think that they need. We need to ask God and then we just need to continue to do what God have called us to do in Jesus name. And so it says Ephesians 5 and 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. See, that means when you submit to your husband, 
Submit to him like you submitting to God Almighty. That's the way you submit to him as unto the Lord. When you serve him, it's like you serving God. When you, you, you submit to him in that way. And, and that's the way you submit to your husband. And it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in every way. And that's in 522. Now, you don't submit yourself to no, nobody else like they your husband. You submit to your own husband, your husband. That's your husband. That's who you made that vow. That vow for better, for worse. Both of y'all made that vow. For better, for worse, in sickness and health, till death do us part. So you submit yourself unto your own husband. Okay, and I want to read something to y'all. And I'm going to be coming to y'all, if the Lord's will, if he bless me to do it, with different devotions. This one devotion for couples is very good. And then it's another devotion called the love language in a minute. That's good. And this is called... Um, you could be the wife of a happy husband. And it got more scriptures in here. So I'm going to start reading from here today. And I will get back with y'all whenever I can. Y'all just pray for me. So And just listen to this. And uh, it's called accepting your husband as he is. Accepting your husband as he is. And it says the most important gift from God is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. For the married woman. So that means... The most important gift from God is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So, wives, understand, your husband is not your first love. It's Jesus. It is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our first love. It's Jesus Christ. It's not our husband. It's not our children. It's not our preacher. It's not, it's not nobody but Jesus Christ. God is our first love. God is our first love. God is our first love. And I don't know how many times I need to tell you, but God is our first love. When we can know that... When we know that and live that and breathe that and our every being be that, then guess what? We'll be at so much peace knowing that God is our first love. Because, see, God never changes. God will never change. And he can't lie. And he will never, ever leave us. He ain't going to abandon us. So we need to know that God is our first love. And so it says his next most important gift is, is her marriage. That's the second most important is our marriage. So we can't even put our children before that. It said the sucking is because we training our children to be independent and our children belong to God. And so and, and we belong to God. Everything belongs to God. So we train our children to be independent and move out. But the husband and wife, we cleave together. We become we one flush until death do us part. So it says it is a relationship God created and honors as she responds to her husband in the way God means her to. She can expect God to bless her. See, if you, if you treat your husband good and honor and respect and submit to your husband, then God going to bless you. But, ooh, wait. Mm -mm -mm. Don't disrespect your husband. Please don't. Don't do your husband wrong. Please don't. Please don't. I'm telling you, treat him with love and God will bless you. So it said marriage, a wonderful gift of surprise package. You may have thought when you received your gift that it was perfect, but ain't none of us perfect. But after the exchange of our dues, when you begin to unwrap your package, the gift turned out to be a surprise. You may have even decided that you had the wrong husband, but you didn't. It's important to realize that even though you did not know exactly what you were getting, God did. One wonderful thing about God is that he does not fail. If you trust him, he will take all things and work them out for your good. Romans 8 and 28. He can use the very thing in your husband that you dislike most to mold you into the image of Christ. He wants you to settle down to a lifetime of enjoying the gift you promised to honor and to cherish. What acceptance evolved? That means we need to accept our husband just as he is. Just as he is. Because that's what God let me know. Accept my husband just as he is. My, 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 God let me know in my first marriage to treat my husband as if he already was saved. Just and that's the way we're supposed to do it. And it said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 and 8. God loves and accepts you unconditionally. You are not on probation with him. Unconditional love and acceptance then should be the basis of your marriage. That means that's unconditional. No matter what. You love him. I don't care what. You love him. That's it. 
It ain't got nothing to do with performance or nothing. I love you for you, not for what you can give me, not for nothing else. I love you for you. And uh, at times you may feel that it is asking too much of you to accept your husband as he is. But I guarantee that as you begin to accept him, you will have developed a more meaningful relationship with him because both of you will have the freedom you need to mature. When you accept your husband the way he is, you will give him the freedom to be the man he wants to be. He will have freedom to come and go as he pleases and to make his own decisions. In other words, true love is letting go. Your husband will love you freely as he did when he chose to marry you unless you stifle that love with your possessiveness. A plant needs water, sun, and fresh air with room to spread its root in order to grow and be healthy. Even so, a man needs unconditional love, freedom, and acceptance in order to love and cherish you as God meant him to. As you love your husband unconditionally, Traditionally, without demands and ultimatums, you will see him drawn to you like steel to a magnet. True love is beautifully described in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 7. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor bores over with jealousy. It is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. It is not rude and does not act unbecomely. Love goes love god's love in us does not insist on his own rights or his own way for it is not self-seeking it is not touchy or fretful or resentful it takes no account of the evil done to it pays no attention to a suffer wrong it does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness but it rejoices with right and truth prevail love burrows up under anything and everything that comes is ever ready to believe the best of every person and that's what we supposed to believe in our husband and wife the best of them it hopes and, and fails under all circumstances and it endures everything without weakening remember you do not have the power to love like that but jesus christ can love through you if you allow him to Giving your expectations to God. The basis for your discontentment and inability to accept your husband lies in your expectations of him and his failure to meet your goals. When he fails to live up to your expectations, you may be hurt, irritated, and disappointed. You and your husband will only be contented and free when you quit setting goals and stop expecting him to do to be who he is not. And um, so it, it talks about um a circumstance where the uh the the wife kept on trying to tell her husband to do this, to do that, to do this, to do that. And at one time, she found that he had other habits she considered unclothed. She tried to correct him. But instead of changing Don, her efforts only put a strain on their relationship. And when the, the, the uh, wife finally committed her expectations to God, the tension between her and Don disappeared. So that means instead of you going to your husband saying, do this right, do this right, you doing this wrong, this hurt me, this, that, 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 go to God. Still love him and you go to God. Let God show it to him. But you still do the right thing. And it said, um, changing your husband. It may seem only right to help your husband change attitudes, traits, and actions that are making him unhappy. But that are making him unhappy but your well-being efforts will communicate to him that that you don't love him as he is and um i want you to be different a man wants his wife to be proud not ashamed of him when she is not he becomes discouraged the masculine abilities of god has given him to cope with life are crushed instead of liberating he cannot live a healthy satisfying life when constantly on trial like you constantly telling him you wrong you wrong you wrong you did that wrong you hurt me you did and you constantly telling him that he already being beat down by the world he already being beat down on his job then when he come home he got to hear you you treating him bad i mean dog i mean you supposed to be building your husband up but why you turning him down your intentions may be sincere, but can lead to disaster. God says there is a way to seem it right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's Proverbs 16 and 25. God did not give you the job of convicting your husband of sin and error. So it's not our job talking about you wrong, you wrong, you wrong, you wrong, like he on trial. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will let him know. When you take on that job, you only get in God's way and slow down his work. Neither are you to be your husband's mother, correcting and trying to him. Having good intentions for his future is not enough you must act upon the principles set forth in god's word communication breaks down in atmosphere of non-acceptance when your husband tells you what he 
has said or done, don't criticize him. Don't point out where he was wrong or tell him what he should have done. If you do, he may decide it is less painful to keep his thoughts to himself and stop confiding in you. Only when he is sure of your total acceptance will he confide in you. If you hold his confidence is sacred he'll know he can trust you not to ridicule or belittle him if you must tell his secrets to someone tell them to jesus christ you the critic are you aware that unasked for advice is really veiled criticism when your husband didn't even ask you for advice but you constantly giving him advice it's just another way of attempting to change your husband and so it's saying don't criticize. Let's see what Jesus said about criticism. Don't criticize, and then you won't be criticized, for others will treat you as you treat them. And why worry about a speck in your eye of a brother when you have a board in your own? Should you say, friend, let me help you get the speck out of your eye when you can't even see because of the board in your own? You hypocrite, first get rid of the board. Then you can see to help your brother. So when you criticize your husband or anyone else, you are assuming that I am better than you, attitude. Wouldn't it be wiser to ask God to show you your failures and let him deal with your husband as he sees best? Make it a habit when you have the desire to change something about your husband, to ask Christ to show you your own faults. Yes, Lord. If you follow Jesus' advice to be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself, your critical self-righteous attitude will disappear. Don't try to change your husband by demanding your own way. Though you may feel you have succeeded in some area when he gives in, he may just want to keep peace in the household. Over a period of time, your domineering attitude may develop a coolness in your, man, in your husband and eventually destroy his love for you. You may win a few battles, but you will lose the war. So... So don't try to change your husband. What you do is you be the best that you can be. Stop looking at your husband on every situation. Just love your husband just as he is. Accept him just as he is. The same way God, don't you know God told that to me years ago? 